We should face this way. Yeah. Yes. No, this way. <laughs> well, it's fine. Whichever yeah. way you want. Uh, oh, oh, it's covered. Cover. Yeah. So, wait, very pleased to have Henry here uh, remotely uh, to give her talk today on bootstrap with a double copy. So thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I'm very sorry it couldn't be in person. I would love to come. And I was thinking back as I was preparing the talk of the happy visits I've had at Texas A&M. And it's, it's been a while ago, but I clearly remember the hospitality and how wonderful it was to talk with people. And, and uh, you know, I hope that things will settle down so that can happen again in the future. But thank you for accommodating the online version. Uh, and I'm very happy to talk about some of the work that I've been doing in the past year or so with these great people, um, including my student Aiden Herdeske, uh, Callum Jones, and Suri Paranchepi. Uh, those latter two have graduated already. Uh, and then postdoc Juan Heng Chi. There's also some new work that I'll mention briefly at the end with a new student, Alan Chen. Oh. So please feel free to interrupt at any point along the way so that it becomes fun and, and interactive. Uh, I'm happy to, to answer questions as, uh, as you have them. Okay, so this work is about the double copy. And what is it? It's a map of scattering amplitudes in some field theory that we'll just call field theory one, times amplitudes in another theory that we'll call field theory two, into some amplitudes in field theory three. Now that's very abstract. And the most famous incarnation of this is that the two field theories in blue are Yang-Mills theory, and you take sums of products of their amplitudes and what you get out are amplitudes in gravity. In principle, it, it, the surface of it from field theory, there's no reason why such a thing should hold. Um, but we will see how there are such maps and it's not limited to these sets of theories. In this theory, uh, I will consider tree level only, but there are other constructions uh, than the, what I will talk about today that have been conjectured to extend at loop level. Okay, so. The, what we will talk about today includes that not every field theory could be the input and not every field theory can be the output, but I'll show more about what that looks like. But first, let's try to dig in and, and look a little bit more concretely what this map looks like. So what I have here are, is the concrete version of the double copy in the KLT formulation, which stands for Kavai, Lavellan, and Tai, who first found such relations in string theory. And what I'll give here is first the field theory version of that. So that's the low energy limit or the prime being, being small limit. And, and we will then also come back to what this looks like in string theory. So let's dissect what it is. On the right hand side, I have a left sector and right sector amplitudes, and they're given some argument alpha and beta that are summed over. Those summed over labels are color orderings. And that refers to the fact that in, in a theory that can work as the input here, you must have some kind of color structure like you would have in Yang-Mills theory from the gauge group. That color structure allows you to write the full amplitude as a sum over color traces. Here, summing over the n minus one factorial permutations of, uh, of the last uh, n minus one labels, keeping one fixed due to the cyclicity of the single trace. Again, this is tree level. So there's just everything can be done a single trace. The kinematic factors of these traces are um, independently gauge invariant, and those are called partial amplitudes or color ordered amplitudes. And it, those are the color ordered amplitudes that enter on the left and the right as the left and the right sector amplitudes in this double copy relation. And then one has to sum over a subset of the possible color orderings. As you can tell from this, there are n minus one factorial possible independent color orderings in principle. Some of them are related through various relations that we'll come to. Uh, but it turns out that you only sum over n minus three factorial of those. Then as you take the sum over color orderings and the product of left and right sector amplitudes with different color orderings, there's a kernel that in, is involved in this project and that's the KLT kernel. And that is something that depends on the Mandelstam variables of n particle scattering. And we will come much more back to what this kernel looks like. I'll give you examples. And then the left-hand side, the sum over products produces that this should produce an amplitude is rather remarkable, but the claim is that if the left and right sectors are Yang-Mills amplitudes, what you get out here 
on the left-hand side as the result of this double copy is the gravity amplitude. You might already see now that this has sort of a sense of being a matrix times a, a row and a column vector that produces something that doesn't have a vector structure, something that's a number. And that is actually a structure that we will see show up more. And again, as we, we talked about, this comes from Carnegie, Lebel, and Tai, which does, in which case it's closed string theory that uh, a product of open string amplitudes and this field theory limit is what I'm describing here. But the structure that we just looked at is the same whether it's the, it's the string version or the field theory version, it's just that the kernel changes and the input changes. Okay, so let's just look at concretely what this looks like at four point. So here, let me pick at four point that, that we know we have to sum over color orderings of which there were n minus three factorial. So that's just one at four point. So I pick one color ordering A, which I picked to just be the color ordering one, two, three, four, the canonical one. And then we could pick B to be one, two, four, three, just to mix it up. So here color coded, you can see how the product works. And there's a kernel, which for this choice of color ordering that entry is just minus the Mandelstam variable S. Now this relation has to hold for all possible helicity assignments of the gluons that I put in here and get gravity. And so since there are two choices, and then I specifically here in four dimensions, there are two choices of the helicity of the gluons, positive and negative, then I will get not just two states for the, the two polarization states for the gravitons, but also two scalars out. So I get the scalars when I pick opposite helicities for the two gluons. Those are complex scalars and I can dissect those into being the diloton and an axion. If you did the same thing in D dimensions, you would not get two scalars, you would get one scalar, which would be the diloton, and then you would get the antisymmetric two form, as well as, of course, the gravitation of polarizations. Why is it remarkable that this works? Well, the color order rules for these color order partial amplitudes is that they can only have poles in lines that are close to each other. The rules are basically, you write down the Feynman diagrams that have the lines ordered in the ordering that appears in the color ordering, and you're not allowed to let any lines cross. And so therefore you can only have poles here in the S channel and in the U channel, which is what I call the one four channel, but not in the one three channel because they're not adjacent. So the one, two, three, four color ordered amplitudes has simple poles at S equals zero and U equals zero, but not at T equals zero. But if I flip four and three, of course I will interchange what I call U and T. And so therefore this has uh, poles in S and T channel, but not in U. On the other hand, the graviton amplitude has no color structure. It can have poles and will have poles in S, T, and U. And those are all simple poles, of course, corresponding to the exchanges of gravitons. So how can it possibly be that a product of say two amplitudes, those two that are listed here, can even get the pole structure of, M, uh, of the graviton amplitude right and avoid double poles? After all, if I multiply the one, two, three, four ordering with the one, two, four, three ordering, then I will get a double pole from the S channel. Well, the answer lies in the fact that we have a kernel as I just described. And in the product we gave on the previous slide, we had the one, two, three, four ordering with the one, two, four, three ordering. That was what potentially would have a double pole and S at S equal to zero. But we see that the kernel provides that S factor to make that a simple pole. It has the U channel from one of the amplitude. It has the T channel from the other one. So it has exactly simple poles in the ST and U channels. And then on top of that, the factorization is correct on each one of those channels so that it actually really does produce the graviton amplitude. And it's really quite non-trivial in some sense that even such a thing should exist. Now I had a choice of what I picked here in the color order product to be my A and B that I summed over. So I could also have picked the two color orderings to be the same, A equals B equals one, two, three, four. In that case, we seem to be even worse off because we would double the S pole and we would double the U pole and we wouldn't even get a T pole. But in that case, the kernel nicely has a form S times U over T that cancels the potential double poles in S and U while providing the missing pole in T. And this picture is generally true that the role of the double copy kernel is to eliminate double poles from the product of the amplitudes while providing missing poles. And we can see this quite simply in the structure where there's just one term in the sum and one product. 
but it also has to work when you're summing over multiple different channels when n is larger. So for n5 and above, you have more terms in the sum. It turns out that the, can the, the kernel also has certain other bonus properties in that it enhances the soft behaviors of the gluons to be those of gravitons. And it will enhance when you have goldstone modes put in, then will enhance their soft behavior too. And sometimes enhance non-goldstone input on the right-hand side of the relation to goldstones on the left-hand side. And it can also en enhance unbroken global symmetries as it does in certain cases. So in the title, I said that we had a bootstrap for the KLT double copy. That means that what we're really interested in is exploring what kind of double copies that might exist if there's something unique about this. And we see that any way of trying to change what the double copy kernel is would very likely mess up this nice structure of even providing the right fold structure. In other words, it's, it's, not, it's non trivial to alter the kernel in such a way that what you produce from the double copy is an amplitude of a local field theory, even, even something that would not preserve that at three levels. So there's something to, to be aware of and, and we will. Now there's another thing that's important about these relations that I showed you. I, I gave you two different versions of how to produce the graviton amplitude. One here with uh, two different color orderings and one with the same as the input and different kernels. But there's only one gravity amplitude. So no matter which ones I choose, I better get the same graviton amplitude. In particular, loose two expressions must give the same result. And so if I subtract this expression from that expression, and I then take care of the overall non-zero factor with the one, two, three, four ordering, then I see that it must be true somehow that Yang-Mills amplitude satisfies relations such as the one written here. And that is true, otherwise the double copy wouldn't give a correct answer for all choices of, of the versions of the double copy. And such a relation here is now known as the BCJ or baron Carrasco johansson relation at four point. In fact, I could have picked any one choice of A and B color orderings to put in here at four point. And that would have generated a set of relations that had to hold true in order for the result of the double copy to be the same, no matter what this basis choice would be. And that those relations that are generated are nothing but what are known as the kleist kopff relations, which are really trace reversal identities of which they're free given the angered one. And then you want double copy, sorry, sorry, you want decoupling relation, which says that if, if, my, if my color order, if my color group had a U1 factor, that photon associated with that would have to decouple. That gives this relation here. And then there's the BCJ relation I just presented you. So if I think about the, the possible color orderings of which there were N minus one factorial, so six different ones at four point, these gave me five relations among you, those that leave a single one and a single number one was also n minus three factorial. And it's no coincidence that the number of, of um, color orderings we sum over in the KLT relation happen to be n minus three factorial. But we can of course also uh, explore uh, that more. So now if I ask the questions, which field, field, field theories have three amplitudes that can be double copied to give some sense of the result here. One criteria that they must have is that they must be such that they obey these KK or these joint KK BCJ relations, because otherwise you wouldn't get a unique answer for the amplitude on the left. And so that gives a selection criterion in the space of possible field theories as to which theories can be input of the double copy. Okay. So this gives us another way of exploring the landscape of field theories, namely what can you actually possibly put into these relations as input and what can come out. So here are some examples. We know already, I told you that Yang-Mills tree amplitude to obey the KKBCJ relations. If you supersymmetrize it and look at super Yang-Mills theory, it similarly obeys these relations. It turns out that leading order chiral perturbation theory, by here I mean the two derivative theory, a nonlinear sigma model uh, likewise obey these KKBCJ relation. And then there's a model that we'll return to more and I'll say more about what it is known as the bi-adjoint scalar model that also obeys these relations. What about higher derivative operators? If we're thinking in the context of effective field theory, as you would, for example, in a low energy limit from string theory, you might think about what higher derivative operators could then obey these relations and be input in a double copy. 
And these are contexts where people have tried to, including myself, apply the double copy. So it's interesting to, to understand what the criteria give. So if I Yang Mills theory, if I look at F cubed, it has been known since work of Lance Dixon and Brittle that F cubed obeys it, but that F to the four does not. Uh, if I look at the MHV sector, then at four point, there's also up, uh, two possible operators of the form B squared F to the four as a single trace operator. One of them obeys KKBCJ relations and the other one does not. So that is clearly some selection criteria here. And you can go to higher orders and here's the counting that is given. Likewise for chiral perturbation theory, the leading order obeys the relations. There are two operators at four derivative orders at four point one could imagine adding. They do not obey the, the KKBCJ relations. There's one operator at the next order that does and one that doesn't. Uh, at, if, you, if you've explored at five point, something like the Western Union Witten term, that does not obey these relations and so on. So clearly having these KKBCJ relations as necessary for the input of the double copy is some kind of selection criteria on the space of EFTs as well. Uh, can but I ask a oh, Yes. Sorry, I, can I ask a question for, for if I look at Yang Mill squared? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, is, uh, are the, I'm just curious what the constraints on, uh, on the corresponding higher derivatives on the, gra on the gravity side look like. Right, so this, this is part of the question. If, given that I can't have the most general operators on the input, does that mean that I'm constrained in what can be the output? Right. And that is something that I will try to answer when we generalize this procedure. And this is in fact why we're after this generalizations. Okay. Um, maybe just to, to give an input of why this came up in my research earlier before we worked on this was that we were interested in the types of operators that you need in von Infeld theory in order to at one loop order, restore electromagnetic duality. Something at the surface that you shouldn't be able to do but it turns out that at, at four point, a local finite counter term could, could actually achieve that trick. It's just a matter of, of finite local counter terms. And then the question is, one info can be produced as a double copy, as I'll show you. Is that compatible with that finite local counter term? And it turns out that somehow that could not be produced in the usual double copy. And then the question came up, but are we really looking at the most general double copy? And I'll try to motivate why we are certainly not looking at the most general double copy as I go a little further. Does that help a little bit? Okay, but, but please ask again also, because this will come up for sure, what can actually be produced by the double copy say on the gravity side. Okay, so here is basically what we're trying to do. And so in the context of EFT, and I think also related to, to Daniel's question is, I want to try to take double copy of Yang Mills with high derivative operators, right? And I have my kernel and I want that to produce gravity with some high derivative operators. And so it would seem prudent to also include high derivative corrections in some sense, whatever that means for the kernel, or at least some kind of way of saying, I'm not just multiplying these two derivative expansions, but there should be corrections here because in fact, that's what string theory does. String theory is not just the kernel that I showed you before in those examples, but something that has higher order terms in Mandelstam variables, which come from expanding the string kernel at small level time. So let's actually see what that looks like. It has this string kernel. And what that kernel looks like, the kernel that I showed you earlier was the, uh, had an ordering one, two, three, four, one, two, four, three. And in string, in string theory, that kernel is not just minus S, it's minus sine of pi alpha prime S. And when I then expand that out for alpha prime times S being small, then we see that at leading order up to some overall irrelevant constants, I'm going to get the field theory kernel we just described, which is of course where the field theory kernel comes from. But then there are higher derivative corrections to the kernel or what I should actually call higher uh, Mandelstam orders, uh, or higher polynomial orders and momentum variables um, sitting there. But it's clear that those are not the most general thing you could think of having added because there's only dependence on the Mandelstam variable S, nothing with U or T in it. And that seems maybe odd why there's some selection principle also for the kernel. And we also know this because it's the expansion of sign, there are only odd powers in S. And I could easily have imagined trying to start by adding an S squared term with some arbitrary coefficient and ask how that would alter my double copy. But somehow string theory tells me that's not allowed. And it would be interesting to understand more from a fundamental approach 
um, or bottom-up approach, why I couldn't have had such an S squared, why I couldn't have had a leading order T, what is actually the structure of this kernel that string theory gives us and, and why is it special? So this motivates that one should look at high derivative corrections to the kernel as one way of generalizing the double copy and try to understand what makes the string theory kernel special. So that's, the, that's really the game and say, look, we have these relations. What is from a bottom-up approach, the most general way I can modify this kernel in order to still have something that takes three amplitudes in local theories and produces uh, amplitudes in some other local theory, in, in particular here shown for yang Mills and gravity. But what are the rules? It's apparently, I, I have to be very careful because we know already that the double copy kernel has certain properties. It should eliminate potential double poles. I shouldn't mess that up. It should provide missing poles that were not already in the product but needs to be there in the output. And then third, I have to add a condition that the kernel doesn't include spurious poles, poles that are in location for physical states are not exchanged. That would be very bad because then the output wouldn't correspond to an amplitude in a local field theory. So the question comes down to what are these rules for this? So after this lengthy introduction, what I will explain is then uh, more about how we do this and the proposal we have for generalizing the double copy, which is this bootstrap for the KLT double copy kernel. And what I will start out with is, is talking about the, something we call the KLT algebra, which we base this on, that leads us to a systematic way of understanding the rules for generalizations. And I will talk about what that is. I'll talk more about this by adjoint scalar model. We'll come back to string theory and compare what we get there. We'll discuss then how this works in detail at four point and applications. And I'll look at higher point and beyond, tell you what we know there. And then finally, I'll end with various perspectives and future directions to look at. Um, any questions at this point? Okay. So I gave you four examples that of things that satisfy the KKPCJ relations so they can be used for left and right input in the double copy. So there was Yang Mills, there were supersymmetrizations. And for example, I can just pick this to be N equals four super Yang Mills, but it also works for lower amount of supersymmetry. Uh, there's chival perturbation theory. And here is by adjoint scalar model. And here I'm not thinking about the higher derivative corrected models, just the two derivative theories. So here's a multiplication table that we have for the double copy. If I input Yang Mills from the left and the right field theories, I get gravity plus stiloton action, as we know. And if I supersymmetrize it, the supersymmetry carries over and actually adds up so that n equals four times n equals four gives me n equals eight supergravity. Um, if I took uh, Yang Mills with Chi PT, I get form infill theory. If I and so let me, sorry, let, yeah, let me, I, let me just mention, so I get von Infeld theory. If I take um, N equals four super Yang Mills with chiral perturbation theory, then I get the N equals four super symmetric direct von Infeld theory that lives on D3 brains or a single abelian D3 brain. Chiral perturbation theory with itself is the special Galilean, which is sometimes used in applications in cosmology, so on. And then there's this final theory, this by adjoint scalar model, whose Lagrangian I've written up here. It's a, it's a scalar theory in which the scalars have two color indices. So this is something that, that has not a gauge group as a color group, but something like a global um, flavor group. You can have say the UN times UN prime that has adjoint indices on the both of those UNs. And then there's a cubic interaction which knows about the structure constants of the two groups, uh, the UN say and the UN prime. And it's just, that's the whole thing. It just has that single uh, cubing interaction. Now, if you take yeah, the amplitude, go ahead. So if I want to do a double copy uh, for like a uh, boiling field, like uh, the product of boiling field and boiling field, can I get a sensible result after this double? So, so, so I cannot use born infill itself as input. Born infill, I thinking here about born, born abelian born infill. This is what we, we, we know. Uh, and so it doesn't have a color structure, so I cannot use it as left or right input. Look, just like I can't use gravity as left or right input. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. But I can get it as output, is what we see. So, so what we see from this 
is that the biadjoint scalar amplitudes, if I take that three amplitudes and this simple, simple cubic theory, and I put them into the double copy, I find that no matter what I double copy these amplitudes with, I get the amplitudes back out of whatever the other thing was, including by adjoint theory with itself gives itself. And that tells me that if I think of this map, this double copy as a map that takes field theory times field theory into field theory, then that map has an identity element. And that identity element is that theory, the by adjoint scalar model, sometimes called the cubic by adjoint scalar model. And so we can summarize our multiplication table to say that this statement here by adjoint times by adjoint gives by adjoint is really just a statement in an algebra that one times equals one times one. And of course, all the other elements of that calling it an identity element is that one times left gives left and one times right gives right. Now string theory with its different kernel also has an identity element similarly. And that identity element is in fact this by adjoint scalar model with a certain select set of high derivative terms that generate those higher powers in the Andelstam variables that I showed you before when we discussed the string theory kernel. So this leads us to the proposal that the KLT algebra is a fundamental principle for generalizing the double copy. And when you take that principle, then what we are led to is the fact that if I have an identity element and I want to try to change what the product rule is, it's natural that I also have to change the identity element. And if I change the identity element, I need to change the product rule so that this equation holds. And that leads to a bootstrap equation for the kernel itself in that the identity element uniquely determines the product that I'll, as I will show you. And that way, if I start changing by adjoint scalar theory plus generic high derivative terms, this equation will tell me which high derivative terms can possibly be allowed and how the Wilson coefficients of those high derivative terms may have to be related and linked to each other at lower and higher orders in order for such a, relation here, a relationship here to hold, namely that this really is an identity element. And then it turns out that the other two statements that this is an identity element with a generalized product will give you generalizations of the KKBGJ relations, which by the way, in string theory are the monotony relations of the amplitudes. So they will generalize the monotony relations we know from string theory. Okay, so that's the principle. And let me now try to unpack why one equals one times one is actually some non-trivial statement and how that restricts the higher derivative operators. And to do so, I first have to tell you a little bit more about this by adjoint model. So first of all, who even ordered the silly cubic model? Well, one way of understanding how it really naturally shows up, even though it wasn't how it showed up historically in the field, is to, to look at a different version of the, the double copy, the more recent one by Baron Carrasco and Johansson, which says that any color ordered amplitude can be written in a form of uh, basically something where you have trivalent diagrams and you have the scale, some scalar prop propagators for those. You have your color ordered factors, and you have numerator factors. Now this statement is actually quite trivial. You can always rewrite things as this contact term if you just multiply and divide by some propagators. It's a non-unique form. There's nothing special about saying that you can write the amplitude this way. What is special is they conjectured that once you have an amplitude in this form, there exists a form where whenever your, uh, wherever your color factors satisfy their appropriate Jacobi identities, then so does the numerator factors. This will not happen for any way you write the amplitude, but it is, is supposed to be conjectured to happen um, and, and be possible. And you can prove that this is true at tree level for young mass theory. Then their claim is that now that they have the same algebraic relations, you simply replace your color factor with a numerator factor of the same or another theory. And whoops, the outcome is in fact the double copy amplitude. And that is again, of course, a very remarkable way to produce the double copy. But given that the numerator factors and the color factors have the same algebraic relations, I could also just have replaced the numerator factor with another set of color factors that obey the same Jacobi's. And if you do this, you get something that is necessarily a scalar, scalar theory with only cubic diagrams. And those scale, that scalar theory is exactly the bi adjoint scalar theory that we get out. So this is a very natural way that bi adjoint scalar amplitudes will arise from the point of view of the double copy and BCJ formalism. Okay, now back to our KLT formalism. And let us now try to understand the statement that by adjoint scalar theory satisfies this 
relation, which is necessary for it to be an identity element. So by adjoint scalar amplitudes, a color ordered uh, under the two different adjoint, under the two different groups that they carry adjoint indices, the scalars carry adjoint indices under. And so we give them two labels as opposed to yang mills here, which just carried one for one color group. Now, for every one of those amplitudes, one index will participate in the double copy as prescribed by our double copy formula. So there's alpha here and beta there. But then of course they have a leftover index for a color ordered index. And that was be of course inherited by the left-hand side. And that is how you can have something that is identity element. It has those two color orderings that are necessarily here on the other side too. Now clearly this is just a matrix multiplication. So in matrix form, I have, uh, and remember the sum is over n minus three factorial labels. So I have an n minus three factorial by n minus three factorial matrix that is equal to the product of three matrices, similarly n minus three factorial by n minus three factorial, each one of them. Now, if I have a relation like this schematically written, then I can multiply from the left and the right with inverses of the MNs. And then I can solve and see immediately that I get that it must be that SN is the inverse of an N minus three by N minus three matrix. And that is good because if I put in the BAS amplitudes into the MNs, then it turns out that in fact, the full matrix that I could have, which is N minus three factorial, N minus one factorial by N minus one factorial doesn't have full rank, but it does have rank N minus three. So all these matrices are indeed invertible. Okay, so the, the logic that came out of this simple manipulation is that the KLT kernel is determined to be inverse, the inverse of the uh, submatrices of the, of the matrix of BIS amplitudes. This was already noticed by Kachasu and Juan in the CHY formalism of the double copy of, of scattering amplitudes, the scattering equation version of that um, in 2013. Okay, so this was not new, but something that was known. Now let's just see how that works in practice. So I have the three amplitudes with two color orderings. The two color orderings say that the terms to include in terms of Feynman diagrams are those that are compatible with both color orderings only. So if the color orderings are the same, I get the usual S and U channel from the cubic interactions with exchanges uh, of a single particle, of course. And then if I switch the order of three and four here in the second entry, the only common channel would be the S channel. And so I only have the S channel diagram and I pick up a minus from that interchange of three and four because of the anti-symmetric structure constants in the cubic interaction. And then our relation told us that the KLT kernel is just the inverses of this and at four point N minus three factorial is still just one. And so we simply get these nice simple kernels and up to, if you set G to be one here, that cubic coupling constant, then you get exactly the kernels that I showed you in the first part of the talk when I first unpacked the KNC formula. Okay, so that makes sense. I can now write out my double copy and I can see how I get KLT relations and so on, KKBCJ relations also out of those things. Okay, so, what then ensures the independence of the choice of n minus three factorial? Well, so now that we know something about the, the kernel, we could try to write the double copy in two different ways. So I pick some set of color n minus three factorial uh, color orderings to sum over here. And then for the right sector, let me pick a different one indicated with a prime. Subtracting those two equations with each other and, and factoring out the AL, I can see that the basis independence is ensured so long as this relation here holds. But now I know that the inverse of the kernel is just my MN matrices. So let me multiply by MN prime. That gives me an identity here. And of course I multiply by my M prime there. And then I can read that this statement is nothing but the statement that the double copy of my adjoint scalar amplitudes times the right sector amplitudes determined by the product determined by the kernel is equal to right sector amplitudes. And that is exactly the statement that one times R equals R and similarly for the left sector. So it is in this sense that left times one equals left and one times right equals right are really a different way of writing the KKBCJ relations. And that is why we will generalize those. 
when you go and generalize the kernel. Uh, questions? Um, can I ask a question? So if, yes. you, go, if you go back to the that, that diagram that you had where you had different field theories on uh, row and yes. column, um, there are some theories which don't appear on the row or column, right? For example, uh, n equals eight supergravity or n equals four supergravity. So, I mean, if you multiply those, take those theories and multiply with the bayer joint scalar, do you get back those theories? But I can't, I can't do that. So, so at least not the way that the KLT formula is prescribed because it tells me to sum over the color orderings of the amplitudes in one of the, in, in each of the input theories. I see. So, so I am not allowed to use that as an input. If I, if I look I, at- I guess, what, I guess what I'm trying yes. to say is when you establish this relation that one times yes. L, L and one times R is R, or the other way, L times yes. one is L and R, yeah. one times R is R. Uh, you need to have a full complete set of uh, elements, right? I mean, there are yeah, some- Yeah, so, so mm -hmm. go ahead. Yeah, there, there are some elements here which sort of fall outside of that algebra. So um, I was- Yeah, so, so I guess the logic is that when I determine what is allowed input for left and right, this, this is basically the criteria for it. If, if, I, if I can't put it into the double copy relation, it's not allowed. Is, is the presumption. Whether there's a way of generalizing that is, is another question. There's, an, there's another sort of weird thing that could happen, right? If, if I wanted to try to input gravity into, into this left-hand side, and then I should be allowed to then double copy gravity with itself, for example. But, but, but the helicities of the states will always add. And so I would necessarily get something with spin four, massless spin four and flat space out of that. And we know that that's not consistent. So, so there are some logical reasons for not wanting to put anything with spin higher than one into the input amplitude. So maybe another question is, um, yes. so far we got four fields on uh, basic fields, let's say. Are they any more or just restricted to these four? These four, so there's, I can also take n equals one super young mills, n equals two super young mills, of course, and put in. And of oh, course the, the question, okay. And so, so, so it's sort of a discrete set of points, if you wish, in field theory space that I can put in where we know that these relations, the KKPGJ relations hold. And, right, and so, and, and so what you can then do is when I expand to effective field theory, I'm sort of expanding a, re a regime around those where certain operators that lie there can be double copied, but not all, as we saw. So what, what we want to know, understand is not just in the context of a higher derivative fee, uh, terms in EFT, what can be double copied, but also more broadly, um, is there a way that I can change the product rule in such a way that are theories that are not listed here that could be double copied? But, I, but the presumption is that I do have something that provides at least one color structure. Okay. All right, so, um, so we did this. Now let's come back to the string theory kernel and then understand what that looks like. So, the, so the, we learned that the kernel must be the inverse of these amplitudes. So that means the amplitude must be the inverse of that kernel. So what I showed you before was a, an example of a kernel that was just sine of pi alpha prime s with a minus. And so the inverse of that is just one over that at four point. And so if we expand out again in small alpha prime, we see that the leading order terms is the BAS model amplitudes that I showed you before, and then something that corresponds to higher derivative terms. And specifically, if I wanted to write this in a Lagrangian fashion, this term here with a single S would correspond to some term of a form B squared F to the phi to the four, again, with some, some of course, color structures associated with it, with an alpha prime control factor. And then the next order would be d to the six phi to the four with some alpha prime to the cubed order um, and so on. And you could ask then in the field theory language, why isn't there a phi to the four term? Why isn't there a d to the four phi to the four term? What happens if I try to, to play around with the general set of high derivative terms? And by the way, this, these kernels were explored from the double copy of string theory by Mizero. Okay, so to just summarize where we are, we want to take this double copy algebra seriously and try to use that as a way of, of generalizing the double copy. 
And that will lead to various interesting questions of what was so special about the strings kernel when we get there. Okay, now we have this uh, studied this at, at endpoint. So let's try to understand how these equations become a bootstrap equations at four points. So this quote is specifically, specifically with a four point. So anchoring one state uh, because of the cyclic trace, there are six independent color traces. And here I just list some that we use as a basis. Now we have this equation that I said was a bootstrap equation, but so far all we've seen from this is that it means that the kernel is uniquely determined by the uh, three amplitudes of the identity element theory. And so it would appear that if I just plug that back into the equation, that it becomes trivial. Mn equals Mn times Mn inverse times Mn. That's clearly a trivial identity, except that it's not because I have these choices of which color orderings that I pick. So for example, if I pick my color orderings on the left to just be the one, two, three, four ordering, both of them, then those will be the ones that appear here in the inputs. But then the ones that I sum over in my double copy, I will pick to be the ones where three and four are flipped. So one, two, four, three. So I have that sum here, I have that sum there. And this flip that you see here is, is cleanly on purpose. And like we can talk about it afterwards if why it's there. So this is a bootstrap equation because it's, it's non-trivial that it holds in general. So let's see why. Now, if I multiply over, then I will and rearrange the equation. I see that this looks exactly like the statement that a two by two minor inside the six by six matrix of possible independent color orderings has to vanish. And that choice, that two by two matrix is not, is two by two matrix is not special because here I just picked some color orderings. I can pick any one of the six color orderings for these. So that means picking any row or any column. And there's a two, the two choices for the sum, there's two choices on the left-hand side. So that defines any two by two matrix of this has to vanish, has to have a vanishing determinant. And so that means that the whole six by six matrix must have rank one. Now, if I plugged in just the biadjoint scalar amplitudes, that would be true. That whole six by six matrix has rank one. But the moment you start adding other operators to it, that will fail. So generically, you increase the rank of the six by six matrix by adding high derivative corrections to the biadjoint scalar model. So how do we analyze this systematically? So here I list the amplitudes in the first row of that matrix. In general, you could might imagine that they define six different functions of S and T. Of course, S plus T plus U is zero because there's some acid states. Now, these are not independent because I can use the cyclic symmetry and momentum relabeling to actually just have F1, F2, and F6 being independent. I don't assume that I would have a trace reversion, so F6 could in principle be different from F1. So if I just have those three functions, they parameterize the entire six by six matrix. And without any further relations among F1, F2, and F6, that matrix will have rank six. But now I have to impose the vanishing of all two by two minors. And that turns out to be solved by three simple equations. One equation says that F1 is fixed in terms of F2 and F6 must equal F1. That actually tells us that we have reversal symmetry at four point. Then finally, there's just one more relation and that says some kind of self-consistency condition for the function F2, which was the color ordering we looked a lot at one, two, four, three uh, in the last row in entry. And so we have these three questions and we, we put in the amplitudes we know from by adjunct scalar, those solves them, of course, the string theory one from the zero solve them. But then the question that we ask is what else solves these equations? And we can see that everything can be parameterized in terms of F2, you solve the self-consistency condition, then you know F1, then you know F6, then you know everything. So how do we parameterize F2? We start with the biadjoint scalar input here. I pull out some scale, which is not important. So you can think of lambda just being one. And then you just can modify, you can, you can parameterize systematically all higher derivative operators that you could add to the biadjoint scalar model in terms of polynomials of S and T with some arbitrary coefficients. Now, one in addition to solve these self-consistency condition for F2, you must also make sure that there are no spurious poles in F1. And if one can only have poles in the S and the U channel, so there in particular can't be any T channels and there can't be all, there also cannot be any poles 
whose residue are polynomials in the model stem variables because that would indicate exchanges of higher spin variables. And we don't have any of those in the Bayetron scalar model uh, with just that one scalar. That gives some locality constraint. And once you solve the bootstrap and the locality, you find that not all terms are allowed. In particular, the constants term that you could have added here, the corresponding to an F to the four correction is disallowed. But you can have T and you can have S, and S is the one that was allowed in string theory with the factor that in some units of, of alpha prime is one minus one six. Uh, A two zero is not allowed in strings, but A three three is, and none of the other ones listed here are, and so on and so forth. You can go to as high order as you want because these are such, such simple systems. So clearly this new couple copy is more general. And if we write it in terms of what the BAS theory is, then this is just a standard cubic interaction. Then the leading orders correspond to four different operators and they have just two independent coefficients that I call a left and a right, depending on whether the U1 decoupling identity is violated on the right or on the left. And it's violated by the fact that the interactions are not just controlled by the anti-symmetric structure constants anymore, but also by the symmetric tensors that you can form out of the, of the group generators. Now, in terms of what I had here, these a left and a right are just given in terms of a1, a1, and a1, zero as, as these relationships. So what can we say about this? You could have imagined replacing the cubic interactions by a symmetric cubic interaction, but that doesn't solve the rank one bootstrap equations. As I mentioned, there's no phi to the four term for the same reasons. We talked about the, the U1 decoupling relations being uh, changed, but this is also known and well known from the string theory case where the same thing happens. Now, if I compare with the strings kernel, it turns out the strings kernel has a left equal to a right. So in certain sense, that means that what we have here is a generalization of the strings kernel to something that treats left and right movers differently. So in, you could think of that as some kind of heterotic double copy box. So let's apply this and see where we get. So now in order to understand what can serve as input, I have to subject, I know now my identity, I know my product rule because it's the inverse of this identity. So now I just have to find out what amplitudes are allowed to put in. So let's, let's take the example of four point Yang mills with high derivative operators. I put in as my ansatz all possible high derivative operators that I can think of or that I systematically can label in amplitudes. I subject them to these relations. And here in the left sector, I find, of course, the usual Yang Mills passes. Then there's a term we knew that F cubed passed, right? So, so there's a term in which there is a pole term with two F cubed vertices that is known also in the usual case. And then there's a new term which is f to the four. And that's good because we know string theory generalize, generalizes, sorry, string theory has an f to the four, of course, in the open string expansion. And so, of course, that should be allowed by our kernel. But whereas in string theory, the kernel would uniquely determine the coefficient of f to the four in terms of upper prime, that is a free parameter here. Then there's a d squared f to the four, and so on and so forth. And similarly for the r sector. If we then double copy with our generalized kernel, what we find, and here are some mess of, of couplings that are not important, but we get the usual Einstein gravity. We get a pole term that has exchanges of both the biloton and the axion, because in principle, we could have different couplings for Yang Mills on the left and the right. And those only happen in the S channel. And then all this big mess, all that is, is the coefficient of the R to the four term, a local R to the four contribution. And the part that would be computed that we produced by the standard double copy in field theory would be this one. This is also where that what controls the contribution in string theory. And the new part that doesn't exist in string theory is the shift of that Wilson coefficient by this quantity A to zero. And you can go to higher order and see what the picture is. So we've examined several different amplitudes, different helicity assignments, much higher orders than is shown here, but this just illustrates the ideas. So here you can see the summarize of, of higher derivatives at different orders. The red ones, are the ones that were not allowed in the field theory KLT. Now the generalized KLT, the blue ones are the new things that are allowed along with the green ones. We see that still not everything is allowed, but more is allowed in the generalized KLT double problem. And if you do the same thing for chi BT, you see a similar pattern. There are things that are still not allowed, but new things that are. 
By the way, fun fact, if you fix the kernel and decide to think about what theories are allowed, it turns out that that links the coefficient of f to the four with the d to the six phi to the four. Uh, and that's perhaps a little peculiar because these are operators of different dimensions, but those would get linked by the coefficient in the expansion. Okay, now, what about higher point? So I just talked about four point and we have these generalizations of the kernels in terms of these AIJ coefficients. But if I try to then go to five point, then I, in my BAS model with high derivative terms, I would have combinations of the usual three point input times local, the local four point input that is fixed by AIJs that we know. So at five point you could risk or higher point you could risk that the bootstrap constraint there would limit your four point coefficients. If that happens, then we wouldn't perhaps never know how high order we would go to unless it all goes down to string theory. So it's important for understanding if we really have a generalization of the double copy kernel, if the bootstrap at five and six points say, leave these coefficients free. So five point, long story short, there are 24 color orderings. You can parameterize everything in terms of eight functions. The bootstrap equation says that these matrices are, not, are ranked two. And so you have to impose that all three by three matrices of this 24 by 24 system vanishes. And that can be done order by order in the derivative expansion. And we found no constraints whatsoever by four point. And we only started getting, we, we, we get local operators at five point, but their coefficients get fixed at four point until you get to seventh order in Mandelstam uh, above the leading order, seventh order above the leading order. Um, and not actually seven orders. It has, starts happening at third order and not the thumbs, which is seven order by the order. Anyway, um, we can test this for five point in mills. There are no surprises that happens. At six point, we've done the test at the few first leading orders just to make sure that no constraints happen. That is new work with my student, as, as long, uh, along with other things. And again, no constraints on the four point input, which is which is somewhat surprising, but but good for the terms of generalizations, and bad in terms of narrowing down to string theory. But that would be an excitement that we'd have to come back to. Okay, so let me now go into perspective and uh, future directions. So to summarize, we have this KLT algebra as the fundamental principle for generalizing things that leads to a bootstrap equation, as well as conditions on what can serve as the input, namely generalizations of AKBGJ monotony relations. Okay, so you might ask, why did we insist of talking about n minus three factorial in the bootstrap? Why was this the rank we imposed? So when we talk about the BIS model plus higher derivatives, then we saw that the generic higher derivatives increased the rank. So if I worked with a higher rank system and inverted matrices of higher rank, then in the limit where I go to low energies and remove a higher derivative directions, those inverted matrices of higher rank than n minus three factorial would all of a sudden uh, be divergent. Uh, and so therefore that wouldn't give a good and sensible low energy limit. So from a point of view of effective field theory, when I think about generalizing in the direction of BAS model plus higher derivative corrections, I have to stick with this so-called minimal rank. Now you, you could imagine also, of course, bootstrapping for different ranks. And so we could go back and re-question everything again forget about the BAS model, but just go back and say, suppose we took this cubic interaction with symmetric structure constants and it's the symmetric constants instead of the structure constants. At three point, it's rank one. At four point, it's not rank one anymore, but rank three, but there are no apparent problems in this. Then you go to five point, it's a rank 11 system. But now the problem is that the kernel you get from inverting those amplitudes has spurious poles. And while that is okay with certain special theories, it it takes amplitudes that obey the corresponding KKBCJ relations, but produces something that is not amplitudes of a local theory from it. And so that is, is a problem that means that this probably doesn't make sense as a double copy, at least not in a fully general sense. We could also ask, what about this F to the four? Drop all the cubic orders. Why don't we start a double copy kernel based on an, a model of the identity, which just has this port against our actions, for example, the fully symmetric structure constants that gives an F to the four term. Four point, no problem. Six point, rank 10, that's fine, no problem. So if you go to eight point, it has rank 273. There's spurious poles in the inverse, and that looks like it would be very hard to overcome. 
the statement that it's actually okay is just checked in a couple of examples, not fully in general. So that's actually not even clear. So we view this as no-go result that may indicate that the minimal rank n minus three factorial is, is somehow unique and special for the double copy. Um, and there are another indication that goes in that direction too, that I will, I will mention very shortly. So um, here are a couple of things that we're thinking about right now. So, so when I showed you the double copy of Young Mills to gravity, I showed you that we got an R to the four local term and it had its coefficient shifted. It turns out that even as we go to very high orders in these four and five point examples, we generated the same type of operators that the uncorrected BIS kernel had, but with shifted Wilson coefficients. And perhaps that small multiplicity, low enough dimension effect, but there could also be a question that is something more fundamental. And so we're studying something along the lines of similarity transformations using some certain hybrid double copy kernels that allow you to change the basis of the kernel from the general one without any higher derivative terms to the one with generic ones. And we're finding some interesting algebraic structures that um, we we're, will we're, we'll soon start to, to write up after a few more tests. And that is with my student, Alan Chen. So then this, I may also mention that we have explored at least preliminary whether this minimal, couple, minimal rank condition is fundamental. So we looked at, at non-minimal rank cases. Um, and, and that was actually also motivated by some work by uh, my students, Jones, Parantropy, and Laura Johnson, where they studied double copy with massive states. And in those double copy with massive states, at four point, there appeared to be no problem in, in any kind of theories that you, you double copy with. But it turns out at higher point, at five point, they found a certain spectral condition that is it's also, also compatible with what you get from dimensional reductions that was necessary for consistency. And that spectral condition was exactly the statement of minimal of, of rank. So that looked fundamental from the point of view of having massive states in the double copy. But, um, it, and so that, that is it's one way of thinking about is also maybe it's fundamental also when you had high derivative operators. Um, then there's a different way that has been proposed in the literature by John Joseph Carrasco and his collaborators in papers from 19 and 21, where they look at high derivative terms, but it, they put those in the color factors of the BGJ formalism. And when you change and put kinematic things into the color factors, it will very clearly look like something like uh, the type of bi adjoint model with high derivative terms. One thing we checked in, in, in some examples of their work was that the type of kernels they have, they also have minimal rank. And there's no examples where they have things that work that are with minimal rank also. Um, so, so that appears to be a connection also again to that minimal rank. Now, one thing in, in the, the work of John Joseph and friends was that they had some exact kernel solution. Here we, we've been thinking about it in terms of higher derivative terms. And so it's, a, it's definitely like a derivative expansion. And, but they had kernels where they had modifications of the color factors that were exact solutions in some sense. So that told us that maybe that should also be some exact solutions to, to what in, in the formulation that we were doing. And it turned out that if you took the biadjunct scalar model, you dropped the a left operator and just stuck with a right and you drop any other high derivative terms, then that turned out to be an exact solution to the rank and the minimal rank condition or to the bootstrap. And here's an example of what the kernel would look like in that case. It just has that T interaction that comes from the combined two terms here controlled by AR. Now we can to look at what the left sector amplitude, the left sector is not uh, corrected because a left was set to zero. So we just have young mills at those orders there. And then on the right factor, we can now have some f to the four operators that is controlled by the coefficient ar in the kernel. And this is what, of course, controlled by because you have to solve the KKBGJ relations. But now when I double copy this with that kernel, you see that those factors here will exactly cancel the corrections in the kernel if I treat these as exact things. And I end up with a double copy of young mills, pure young mills with young mills plus f to the four, which gives me just gravity without any higher derivative corrections. So that is some indication that perhaps these changes of the kernel can actually just go into shifting things around in the Wilson coefficients. 
Uh, and that deserves definitely to be to be studied more, but that's just one example. Okay, so you, you could, for example, also ask, is this also exact at higher point? And it turns out to also be an exact solution at five and six points. Uh, so just as a little curiosity that it, it does hold up. Okay. Um, Another very interesting question is this question of what makes the strings kernel so special or what makes strings special. So a different way of bootstrapping down to say if string theory is, is the unique theory would be to try to impose positivity restraints or to heat run swampland constraints, UV compatibility, whatever you want to call it on the coefficients of the field theory. Because after, after all, we see that the kernel corrections somehow shift the Wilson coefficients around, but if their positivity or upper and lower bounds on these Wilson coefficients, you're not allowed to change them by anything you want. That could narrow down the kernel, which in turn would narrow down what the open string amplitudes are through the generalized monotron relations. And then that might somehow lead to a picture of why string theory somehow gives the unique theory with a, is a unique UV completion that can actually have a double problem. So that is one thing that we're exploring now with a new student, Justin Berman, and my student, Aiden Herdrischke. And so here are pictures of my collaborators, uh, Callum and Trudy, who graduated already. Aiden is in his fourth year. Uh, Juan Heng finished his postdoc this past fall. And then new student, Alan Chen, who, who's working on these hybrid models as well. And so with that, I want to thank you for this trip in the landscape of field theory from a double, point, double copy perspective. And I'm happy to stick around and, and answer questions. Uh, so you mentioned there are some uh, examples of double copy for these mass massive states. So can I ask for the, I mean, what's the result, resulting Lagrangian for this uh, double copy? So it, it has to be, I, I don't, you know, so, so they didn't write down a Lagrangian in their paper, um, but it has to be some theory where you're basically modifying the cubic by adjoint scalar theory by giving some mass to the state. And then there has to be some rules that um, that you put into the story of what double copies with what, because when you, you have to do things in a way that preserves certain color structures, of course, right? So, so, so the outcome of the spectral condition came down to um, a set of, of conditions on the masses that the scalars can have and the things that you double copy can have that are solved at least by things that come from dimension reduction. And that had to be the case that it had to be solved by this because the formulation also the way we do it here of the kernel uh, is general in D dimensions. And while the examples I showed you here were the specific to 40, just to keep things simple in terms of polarizations, then it, they, also, they also apply completely more generally. So if it works, say in five or six dimensions with massless scalars, dimension reduction tells you that that model in 40 will still have a double cover structure. So there has to be something uh, and I think one question that is not known yet, if there are other things that don't arise from dimensional reduction that solve the same type of spectral conditions. I guess, uh, is there any question online? Uh, yeah, sorry, I have, an, I have another question. Uh, uh, sorry, my internet has been really, really spotty. Uh, uh, I, it was really the 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 example that you gave where you just got uh, gravity back was was really interesting, uh, and I'm so I'm, I'm curious like uh, are are there other examples where, where you know some some really interesting hydrogen term just gets washed out? Yeah, I mean, so so the same thing happens. There's there's the next term in the order here that could have been included was this a two zero term. Yeah. If I include that, then and just cut off after that, along with the say R right, then the same thing happens. Really? It washes out. So of course you can discuss like, wait, I'm, I'm, what, what am I doing here, right? So, so I'm, I'm specifically right. saying that I'm working to order T uh, in, in the derivative expansion, two derivatives uh, or two derivatives on the local terms at four point. 
And then I'm saying at that order, the F to the four, which is what is sort of appropriate to include with that order is allowed on the right, but not on the left. But I didn't say anything in including D to the four, or sorry, D squared, F to the four, anything like that. So if you go to higher orders, it's not clear that things would get washed off similar if you really think about that. But, but at least if you just sort of work consistently to the order, I cut it off here, I cut oh. it off there, then it washes out. Um, but you can of course just play around with these things and, and see. Um, that there was another example that was fun about changing the rank, which is if, if I looked at just, if I just pretended to be very naive and said, okay, you know, I don't, I don't care about these minimal rank conditions, I, I will work. I'm happy to change the rank. And so let me just include an F5 to the four along with the BAS. Okay. And then I said, I found a rank three system. And you can easily see that there's various poles in the kernel. But you might say, oh, but you know, if I am very consistent and I only include input that solve the KKBCJ relations with that generalized rank three kernel, could it be that when I double copy, it's not just a product over two things at four point anymore, it's a, it's a sum over three terms because it was rank three, a product, so a sum of products mm -hmm. with three terms. And you know, you can actually get it to work at full point. And so I was giving some summer school lectures last year and, and I had to write a problem for them. So since I was curious about that, that was the problem I wrote for the students to do. Um, and it turns out you can get it to work. And then I, then I think that the, the thing that always is is the problem with these things is once you go to higher point, even if things appear to be fine at full point, the fact that fact at higher point, you rely on factorization to lower point, that's where things get much more constrained. Okay. And I think it's very likely that what, that would kill off such models. Okay, thank you. Is there a question in the chat? No, no, it's not. So any other questions? I mean, another connection to this is, is this whole story, of course, about the celestial amplitudes and the double copy that is showing up in that context, where what is maybe less, but could be have some, some influence is, is the, the role of high derivative terms there. So that would be perhaps relevant for that. But, but also just the question of, you, know, you, you, you use one formulation of the double copy there, why, why that one? Um, and, and you could also formulate this, the applications of the double copy to the classical equations of motion. After all, this is tree level, right? So it should be there. So people have looked a lot of this and that direction probably could use some real systematics of what are the rules. So the rules are often adapted to the problem. Um, and, and, it, and, can, and people get, get amazing things to work, but, but it seems like a problem by problem what, what you do. So perhaps there's some way of thinking about the double copy in that context too, of, of, of the other things that one can, can, can do there in terms of mapping classical solutions. Okay, maybe if there's no more question, let's thank the speaker again. Stop the recording.